So I'll show you a Cloudera cluster. Uh, in, in the cluster we are using for the lab, we have only read-only access from the admin side, which means you cannot change the replication factor or block size or anything. These are all done by admins. We can upload the data and then say that run the program, that will work. But that we will do tomorrow. But let's look at the cluster, right? So, so far we are talking cluster, cluster, and we are not seeing any cluster so far. So I think Cloudera, Hortonworks, and uh, Mapper, these three are getting used actually. Both, both, all the three companies are sort of famous, I can say. So do you have this in your uh, LMS? Like your lab and all. So, um, because some of the things are a bit confusing, so I have to tell you, we have to use Web Console. Web Console will connect the uh, Linux file system where Hadoop is installed. We will do that later. Cloudera Manager is the admin interface of the cluster. So, I will connect with it, but we will not be able to modify, but we can see stuff. So, if I go to Cloudera, to administer the cluster, like you want to add a service, remove a service, add a machine, remove a machine. So the administrator, if you are a, a, a Hadoop administrator, you have to do all these things, add users, remove users, permissions, everything can be done by Cloudera Manager. And why I did not speak about this, because we will not be doing anything using this, an admin utility. But to look at the cluster, this guy is good. So let me show you that. Now you have to install it. So if I am running in a company, I have to purchase, let's say, 20 machines physically. Yeah, and then I have to, there is a process of installing Hadoop. This cluster already has installed. It's a running cluster. If you're creating from scratch, you have to purchase, let's say, 20 machines and download something called Cloudera Manager and run it. And it will help you to set up the cluster. It will tell that which is your master, which is your slave, what is your block size, what is your... You will have uh, access to this, right? I mean, if you want to practice, this setup is already available to you, right? So this is your Cloudera cluster, okay? This is just an admin GUI, okay, to the cluster. And once you log in, this is your dashboard. So you are looking at a Hadoop cluster. First point you have to understand. Second point, what is there in the Hadoop cluster? These are all the services installed. See, HDFS, okay, HDFS, Hive, Hue, I will talk about it, Impala, Kafka, Uzi, Solar, Spark, Yarn, Zookeeper, all these services are running in the cluster. You see a green. Right? This is just to get a quick overview of the cluster, like what is running in the cluster. Fine. How many machines are there in the cluster? You click on this host menu. Can you see? Can you see these machines? These are all machines, one, one, one. Right? So how many machines are there? I think there are nine machines. See, good health, nine. Nine machines are there in the cluster. And you can also see their configuration. If I scroll here, can you say they see their RAM and hard disk? What is the physical memory? That is the RAM. The first two machines are, first four machines are 8 GB RAM. Next one is 16 GB RAM. These are their hard disk. Can you see? And you can see how much storage is full and all, everything, right? See here. So this guy is having 32 GB RAM and 18.8 .8 is currently used. Some process will be running. This guy also had a 249 GB hard disk. 600 GB hard disk, 50 GB hard disk. You can all see from a single window. It's very easy. So it is not as complicated as you thought, by the way, right? So this is just the host menu. Uh, now, if you look at HDFS, this is HDFS. Click on HDFS, okay? You will see this HDFS menu. This is all related to HDFS. In HDFS, what we learned? Replication, block size. So where do you configure this? There is something called configuration. And do you want to change the, see, it is saying read only. I cannot change it. But do you want to see the replication factor of this cluster? DFS dot, what is the replication factor? Three. Click there, you can change it to two or 10 or whatever you want. If you are an admin, you are not an admin. Do you want to see the block size? DFS dot block size. So I can click here and change if I am a Hadoop admin and it will be applicable to everybody immediately and all. Uh, somebody was asking about balancer, right? Where is balancer? I can say actions. Okay. Uh, the problem is that some of these things I will not be able to run. Ah, this is balancer where it is running, uh, but I can run a command. It's not green. It is not running. If it is running, this process will come as green, actually. Uh, then chart commands, configuration. Uh, so there is a lot of configuration. Okay, so that is one thing we saw and uh, host menu we saw already, right? 
So, so far we discussed only HDFS and here is Kafka. If I go to Kafka, just go to Kafka, okay. Kafka says Kafka broker 3. That means three machines are running Kafka. I told you Kafka will be running in a cluster. Since this is a lab setup, we are running Kafka inside Hadoop only. Ideally, we run it separately because it needs storage spaces to hold your data. But here Kafka brokers are three. We are running inside here only because this is only a cluster we have. I mean, these machines, if I go to these machines, I will show you. If you go to this host menu, you can expand a host and see what it is doing. For example, if I expand this guy, and also I can go to HDFS and see that. For example, I go to HDFS and instances. What do you see here? Active standby, two machines, two name nodes. I told you, right? Active and standby, they are running, right? So the same machines are running Kafka here. It's not a separate cluster, by the way. That's what I meant by that. Uh, I don't have really admin access, otherwise something could have been done. I don't want to mess up the cluster also, by the way. Uh, so some of the menus are actually disabled. We can't run them. Ideally, that should not be the case because <laughs> then it is you not utilizing the proper space, right? So ideally, you will set up a separate broker and that will download the data actually. They are all running on uh, AWS. I want to clarify one more thing. Uh, if you go to this big data cloud lab, this Cloudera manager you don't really need because that's the admin interface. You are not going to do any admin activity. The important thing that you need is web console. So if you click on web console, I just clicked on that. And there is a there is a product called Hue. This is very important. There is a product called Hue. This Hue is a third party application. Okay. But it is very, very popular. Why do you need Hue is that if you are a developer and you want to upload your uh, files to Hadoop, you can use Hue, one of the use cases. For example, I can click this, I'll click Hue, and last the username and password. If I sign in, okay, I'll just sign in. If I click on this HDFS browser, see there, this is my Hadoop. These are all the files in my Hadoop. So Hue is like a web UI to your Hadoop, HDFS file system. So these are all the files and folders. If you connect, you will not see anything here because you are having a fresh account. One more very important point I want to tell you is that in Hadoop, you will have a home directory, user slash something. I have GL faculty. You will have your own directory. Can you try this hue thing on your PC? Just click on this hue, type username, password. See whether you can see this thing. Another point is that sometimes the cluster will become very slow because it is not designed to accept requests from 36 people, <laughs> right? If all of us try to log in, it will say timed out and other things. So different, different users are created in the Hadoop cluster. So if you log in, you will get a home directory, like in Linux. In Linux, what happens if you log on, you will get a home directory. So this is my home directory in HDFS. And since I already created some files, I can see them. You may not be able to see because it is a fresh uh, home directory for you. No, it will be uh, in a non-commodity hardware, like a real server. You know what is a rack, server rack? Because from the point of view of Hadoop, this might be important. Uh, I will explain this one and then pick up your questions. Majors.google.com. So this is for people who do not know, server rack. Do you know what is a rack now? This is a rack. It's a housing where you push all the servers. In all the hi-fi movies, you will say somebody sitting something, typing something in a very big data center and all, right? So that's a rack. Why racks are important? They are important for one uh, reason, because let's say you have three racks. You are having three racks, okay? And each rack has a data node. Not one, there are many. Let's say two data nodes are there. So uh, in reality, when you are installing Hadoop in a cluster, this is how you do, right? Because in a data center, you will have racks and you will have servers. These servers are called your data nodes, right? So I have six data nodes in three racks. Now there is something called rack awareness in Hadoop, meaning if let's say you are copying a block, what you can do, this first copy will go here. 
the second copy will go here imagine and the third copy will go here meaning if you enable this feature called rack awareness hadoop will ensure that the blocks are spread across multiple racks why rack is a point of failure because normally you will supply this power and network everything to to rack so if a rack fails uh, you know if i'm keeping all the three blocks in a same rack if that rack fails then my blocks are gone so hadoop can if you enable rack awareness you have to tell hadoop which data node is in which rack if you do that it can place them like this but why don't it keep like all three in three different racks why the uh, rest of the two copies are in the same rack yeah but same location means these are all in the same data center right ha huh. so this inter rack bandwidth is very important rack to rack the bandwidth is very important so uh, this is just replication right you will be running a lot of programs which will use this bandwidth so to save that bandwidth what it does is that the next replication will happen within the rack rack server to server but this is enough now even if one rack and all the three racks going down is very remote possibility right and my point was i can show you that here so when i show that if you go to all host can you see this so in the rack 1 4 are there rack 2 2 are there rack 3 2 are there uh, and default rack 2 are there default means i don't know they have kept something here but 4 2 2 so this is actually the distribution it is actually available in your cloud era manager see if you look at this picture right in this machine some 30 data nodes will be there each slot you'll have one server they are all a rack server so server is not like this it is like this so the biggest uh, hadoop cluster on earth is with yahoo actually hmm? yahoo holds a record for that they have uh, 42000 machines and still they went bankrupt sold it to some useless company no that's a good question so can i have multiple name nodes yes the concept is called federation meaning ideally if you cross more than 5000 data nodes you need one more name node like 42000 machines i cannot have a single name node to handle because the amount of metadata will become slow that is a problem so ideally yahoo has done some r&d they said that if you cross more than 5000 data nodes you need one more data node that's called a uh, name node that's called federation federation means multiple active name nodes like you can have 10 name nodes all will be working they'll share the load actually right so like that federation is called it. all in one rack actually actually you can put it inside the same data center only you need all of them right because all the data nodes are in one lan so the name node also should be inside that only but they will handle the load actually so some data nodes will be you not know, this name node and all they can handle load file server can store but it cannot process right that's the use case hadoop is not only for storing whatever data you store the data can be processed then and there by the machine so there we are not using hadoop right i we have we discussed it in the beginning of the class no sql databases if you don't want processing if your use case is such that i just want to dump a bunch of images let's say 1 million images i just want to process and display in an e-commerce website i don't use hadoop hadoop is not used for that there you have no sql databases like dynamo db or mongo db right sharepoint if it is a smaller setup sharepoint you can use so it is all business use case the question is that what do i want to do with the data there are other companies who generate terabytes of data they just archive the data i just they generate data i don't want to analyze i just archive the data who cares so it is up to me to decide what should i do with the data right i was working with ge very interesting use case <laughs> ge right the company called ge i have a training next week there so they have an aviation department ge is building this aircraft engine you know that flight engine 80% of the commercial aircraft engines are from ge and what they do so most of the planes are flying with ge engine there is also rolls royce and one more company so all these aircraft engines are having sensors so when the flight is flying they capture the sensor data like pressure and blah 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 and they analyze it to predict when the flight will crash or turbulence will hit or something like that whether you're going to die or something so the idea is that but so i said okay good deal you're doing this they said no it's not a good deal the problem is 
if a flight is flying from let's say dubai to bangalore hmm, there will be two engines hmm, it takes six hours each engine will generate one tv data how many flights are there in total and how many flights fly every day can you imagine the amount of data they don't analyze how can you analyze i mean if i am giving you let's say 1000 terabyte every hour or every minute you can't analyze it so they take a subset of it they have an algorithm which takes a subset of the data and analyze rest they delete and dump <laughs> because it is not humanly possible also you don't need that much amount every sensor data need not be analyzed this is very interesting because they also have locomotive engines train train all the europe and us they run trains and these trains are having sensors so they get also that <laughs> it's very difficult to work with ge because huge amount of data they also don't know what to do with the data right and they have no clue how to say make sense of the data locomotive data is huge actually so the trains will generate a lot of data actually so they get it uh, and then they take it and clean it and just get only a part of the data and they analyze it in hadoop you also have certain file formats for example avro you may not have heard about it avro is a file format we use only in hadoop parquet orc these are all used to compress and store your data in hadoop you can also have compression techniques because sometimes storing the data as it is is not good why don't you compress it but what is the drawback of compression you have to decompress you need a lot of processing power if you want to decompress it so avro is a serialization format it doesn't compress the data parquet and all will compress the data columnly and push the data so i will show you in hive when we discuss hive when you create a hive table you can say that the data has to be compressed it will compress and store the data so my point is not everybody want to analyze all the data in the world that is also humanly not think about facebook how much data they'll be getting probably they are not analyzing the whole data a subset of interesting data that is all they will be doing yes spark is memory intensive ideally spark requires ram so if you give ram it will perform better if you don't give ram it will use hard disk i mean rest of the space will use hard disk performance will be slightly degraded so for streaming and all we need lot of ram the problem is uh, football world cup is going to happen right so let's say you want to write a program which will download all the tweets and find out the most favorite player for football world cup possible right so i can easily stream the data from twitter the problem is i want to find out uh, you know the most popular player every 5 minute imagine probably not 5 minute you want to do so i want to get 5 minute worth data hold it in my memory and process what if 5 minute data is so huge i cannot hold it in memory then it will be slow yes i am just giving an ima uh, imaginary situation where if 5 minutes worth data is in terabytes you can't hold it actually not only twitter any data that you have then you might want to persist into disk some of the data then processing will become slow it is not real time then so when you are running spark streaming and all you know your ram should be available otherwise it will become very slow today's match you will predict tomorrow right so things like that can happen so that's not really good actually so a lot of considerations are there where you have to use all these